Okay, um, for the purpose of the interview, this is interview number two with uh, AJ and Mary. Um, I did the last one, what, what six weeks ago, two Probably. months ago, yeah. and um, found myself, as I was relating over lunch, uh, looking at your teachings and um, finding out there's more to you two than meets the eye, <laughs> and AJ's teachings in, specifically have um, been a little bit frightening for me because they've actually hit some nerves and they've resonated and uh, and got me a little bit worried because here's a guy who calls himself Jesus actually making some sense to me and uh, so that's the got, deluded guy is making the, some sense. The deluded guy is making some sense now. <laughs> so we're going to uh, ask AJ and Mary for some more um, information on some of these topics. Mm -hmm. Okay, you say that the most important thing in everyone's life here on earth and in the spirit world is to know that there is indeed a God who created them and wants them to desire out of their own free will to have a relationship with him or her. Mm. And you often use both pronouns. This God, you say, is a being. But by that, you don't mean something that's actually has form and is in the one place and can be seen by somebody at any particular time. Is that is that right? Or? Well, it's a little more complicated than that, perhaps, because um, it is a God is a being that has form, but just not a form that anybody at this point in the universe is being able to um, ascertain because of their own condition. So, so the potential is in the future mm -hmm. that that once we're in the pro proper condition, but we may actually see the form of God. The other issue that you face, though, with God's form is that the universe existed... Uh, sorry, God has existed before the universe was created. That being the case, God existed in form before the universe existed in form. So to actually see God, theoretically, and since nobody actually has seen God with physical eyes, but theoretically, you would have to step out of the universe to do so. And, and the question then becomes is how do we get into the condition that's great enough to step out of the universe in order to be able to perceive God? The way I see things is that the universe is a part of God's creations. I know in New Age philosophy, a lot of people think the universe is God. And I don't agree with that because God has a personal, you can have a personal relationship with God and it's very difficult to have a personal relationship in terms of an emotional, personal mm. relationship with, with a, with a non-thinking, non-feeling entity like the universe. But the per and a personal relationship with God can be established as a truth, and there are many billions of people that have already established that. So we can have a personal relationship with God, but um, our knowledge of God is going to be quite finite at any point in time. And the reason why it's going to be finite is because it's going to require us getting into the condition of understanding before we can understand the immensity of God as a, as a being. And for us to get into that condition, we have to follow a certain process that God designed for us to follow so that we could get into a condition where we can begin to perceive God and begin mm -hmm. to perceive God's qualities, God's nature, God's attributes and so forth. So, so what I feel is, is occurring is that God is showing us as a, as a human race how to approach the point of actually beginning to see God as God truly is. And that is going to be a process that we need to take ourselves through. If we desire to know God, we'll take ourselves through that process. And the end goal of that process may be that we actually physically step out of the universe. We, we don't really know what the end process of that will be at this point. Okay. We don't, we might even be in the end, the end process might be potentially that we create universes of our own. That might be the end process once we've grown enough in love to do so. And so in that where we become like God in the sense we're still God's children, but we've now truly become like God in the sense of a fully grown child of God capable of many things that we currently do not understand. But there is evidence about God having uh, being an entity and having form that we but but that form is not of the same matter or material that is a part of the universe that God has created. 
So, so in, in other words, the physical universe, there's nothing in the physical universe that mirrors the form of God. And in the spiritual universe, there's nothing in the spiritual universe that mirrors the form of God in the sense if we're looking at form scientifically. But if we're looking at personality and qualities and attributes, there are millions of things that mirror the, the personality, attributes and qualities of God. Yeah. That and we can examine. The main one being the, that God is perfect love. Yes, so the primary quality um, that God has, is able to give of herself to us at this point in time is love. There may be in future times other qualities that God has that God wants to bestow upon us as well. But love is the first quality because without love, all other things are not able to be understood nor controlled. So the entire universe that we live in is controlled by love and once we become love, we then live in, a, in, in complete freedom in this entire universe that God has created. And the more loving we become, the more potential there is of understanding other things or other qualities of God. Mm. But love is the primary. But Richard Dawkins describes the universe as um, having at its origin of its design pitiless indifference. <laughs> as now, your, your idea is that the universe is actually operated perfectly with divine love. Mm -hmm. yep. why, why is it that a lot of people have difficulty in seeing that? Well, because what they're doing, remember in our last discussion, I talked to you about where mankind is coming from. And where we're coming from in most cases is from uh, a lot of tortured emotions that have been inculcated into us via our own childhood or other events occurring in our life. And so what we start to begin to believe is that, is that the universe is totally indifferent to me. Is that, in other words if we extend that to God, that God doesn't care for me personally. God's just set up this uh, system mm -hmm. that we have to live in because we've got no choice. And, um, and our belief then becomes that this system is quite cruel, quite indifferent and quite unloving. And, uh, and we often, because of our belief system along those lines of thought, also attract um, exactly the same kind of events happening. So in other words, because we believe the system is unloving, there's a tendency to attract then events that feel unloving in mm. order to trigger that grief that we hold on to about that belief. So the problem that we face as humanity is we have a lot of grief about how things have been in our life, the injustice of our life, the pain in our life and so forth, which we then attribute to God rather than attributing it to the actual cause. And the actual cause is actually mankind walking away from God and choosing self-determination rather than living in harmony with the laws of love. Now, if we choose to live in harmony with the laws of love, we find a very different universe. But if we, if we don't choose to follow the laws of love and we choose to abandon those principles for other laws that we feel are valid, such as the law of self-determination, and the laws regarding you know, the feeling that everything is lawless or anarchy, and so therefore we engage a life of anarchy, of always rebelling against law, we will get the natural consequences of that in a, in a, in a law-abiding universe that God's created. So it's like I illustrated last time. It's like us, here's the law of God like a wall. It's us coming up, butting our head against the law of God, and then coming away bleeding and then blaming mm. God for that instead of looking at our own condition and our own desire to, to do the unloving thing. If we brought ourselves into more harmony with love, we would never butt ourselves up against a loving law for a start. And so therefore we would automatically have less painful existence. But also we would have less, uh, we have more loving interactions with our environment, which is all harmonious with love. So therefore, would not create any pain in us individually. Yeah. So you, you have talked about understanding truth <coughs> on an emotional level. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say for the last 20 years, I would have called myself an atheist, mm -hmm. um, really admiring the thinking of Richard Dawkins and, and Christopher Hitchens. And, uh, and I know that you've read some of those books as well. Mm -hmm. 
So you can see where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. um, what affects me, though, is when I look at Richard Dawkins, I don't see his nature as one acting in accordance with pitiless indifference. Mm. And I don't look at my own nature as acting in accordance with pitiless indifference. And so there is something within me that doesn't fit with this perception. Mm. Um, so can you just explain how, what we need to do, what your idea of in perceiving truth through emotions rather than intellect? Yeah, if you, if you look at things from an intellectual perspective, the problem that you have is that there are already emotions existing within you that determine what you can intellectually accept. So, so if I have an emotion in me, for example, and I've brought up this example with you earlier at, at lunch, that if I have an emotion in myself about uh, that I believe love can be punishing, because when I was a child, my parents often might have hit me and then said, I love you, that's why I'm doing this. And so then we have to accept this belief that there is a sense of violence in love. And once we accept that belief inside of ourselves, as we grow up now, um, our intellect will only absorb belief systems that are in harmony with that underlying emotional condition. So I'll be very open to a Christian type of belief system where God is a loving but punishing God, for example, uh, when I'm in that state. And, and the, the problem there is, is that I'm not using my logic very clearly because that doesn't make much sense. Whenever we have violence perpetrated against us, we feel very unloved and unwanted and uncared for and in fact hated. And yet we're actually saying that that's love. And so we're setting up this conundrum, intellectual conundrum, that we've now got to resolve somehow. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we finish up creating constructs, intellectual constructs that resolve the conundrum, rather than just feeling the emotion. Now, if I just felt the emotion, I would always understand that violence is never loving, ever. Mm -hmm. Violence from God wouldn't be loving, just as violence from you perpetrated towards me or me perpetrated towards you or even myself perpetrated towards my child. Mm -hmm. All unloving. And if I just allowed myself to feel when violence was perpetrated towards myself, how unloved and unwanted and uncared for I actually felt, then I would easily be able to see that any violence must be unloving. But because my intellect now is in place and I'm suppressing the emotion from my childhood where my parents belted me or committed violent acts towards me and said it was love, now I'm trying to come up with intellectual arguments to support that underlying emotional condition. Mm. And this is the problem we face, I feel, on earth, is that we're often coming up with belief systems which are intellectually created because we do not wish to heal the underlying emotion which allows those particular beliefs to be created. So really it's a resistance to pain and the experience of our own pain that prevents us understanding truth. If we um, abolish that resistance, then truth is easily accessible to us because we freely connect mm. emotionally and therefore truthfully. So if we have an emotional connection to anything there's a higher likelihood of ascertaining truth than if we just are intellectually connected to that particular thing. And um, so, for example, if we noticed a parent being violent towards its child and we put ourselves in the position of the child where we felt the violence and we felt the anger and rage that often accompanies that violence, we would realise that the child is feeling unloved completely at that moment and therefore what the parent is saying is loving cannot be. Can't be truth. Cannot be truth. Yeah. And it cannot be loving. If we felt the condition of the child, we would be able to automatically see that what is being perpetrated towards it is, is a very unloving act that damages it often for much of its life and therefore causes a lot of other unloving consequences in its life and we would actually be able to feel that and therefore we'd be able to say any act of violence towards another person is automatically unloving no matter what. Or creature. Or creature. Mm -hmm. No matter what the underlying cause is. Mm -hmm. No matter what we justify as the underlying cause. Mm -hmm. So the underlying cause might be, you killed my child, so I feel like I can now attack you violently or kill you. Well, that still doesn't justify it, because, because at the end of the day, 
you would still be feeling unloved, just as I felt unloved yeah. when my child was. Um, now this is this is something that I've always held as an ideal, mm -hmm. nonviolence, mm -hmm. and uh, there's been a few people in history like Gandhi, mm -hmm. and, um, maybe Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. who have embraced this as a truth. Yes. And taken it to the extreme. But when you say to the extreme, can it be taken to the extreme? Well, I don't know. <laughs> See, what in World War II, what should we have done with Hitler? If we were to be non-violent, would we just let him run ramp and do what he likes? Well, you see, if we had been non-violent, Hitler would not have even been able to be created in terms of our supporters as a leader of Germany. Because the creation of Hitler, if you like, was 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 done through the process of what happened in the First World War and and what happened subsequent events after the First World War. So if you examine what happened after the First World War, basically all of the the rights of Germany as a nation were taken away from it. This created a lot of upset and resistance inside of the German populace in terms of the feelings of being dealt unfairly with. They'd already been uh, conquered, and then there was this continual um, oppression after the conquering in terms of other people having con uh, conquest over them financially and, other, and, and in other ways. And because of that, that created then an environment through which a person like him could stand up and start to expose the emotions that were in the German populace at the time, which was mm -hmm. that we feel we should have self-determination and we should, we should be able to rebel against this and, and, and those kind of feelings. And then on top of that, there was the allowance, because of those other emotions, of other thoughts and belief systems that were very unloving in terms of racial prejudicism and so forth, which, by the way, Americans and English and other nations all have. Mm. Um, inside of them as a part of their psyche because they are yet to be released emotionally. So we have this hot bed, if you like, very fertile bed of, of allowance of specific emotions and all it needed was a leader to come along and connect with those emotions in the people and that leader would definitely be supported and that's how Hitler got created in the first place. So, so we, we can't look at something in isolation and say oh, that person created all of those events. We have to see all of the things that are going on emotionally to actually see what was being created. And in the case of someone like Hitler, it was very much to do with all of the events that had happened you know, 20 years before yeah. his arrival. But the, the question is, how, what do you do then if you believe in non-violence? How do you... Do you just run away from the aggressor? Do well, you do you I've, I've, use violence to sort of um, say, well, this is this is pretty bad, but if we let them go, it's going to be worse. So we're going to take this guy out to save all of these people, like with Saddam Hussein. What should we do? Should we intervene or not? Or do we? Well, Gandhi had the best solution, didn't he? Don't you feel like Gandhi's solution was what he called non-violent resistance? Mm. Um, and and that is the loving solution. Don't do anything, mm. even at the threat of death, yeah. don't do anything that is unloving. Mm. Because and I don't feel that non-violence means that you run away. No. <laughs> you stand for truth, and the truth yeah. is that violence is not loving. But also, if, you, if I observe violence occurring against someone else, I would stand for that truth also. And I, I may not violently intervene, but I would certainly... Um, be in a space of not supporting that. What happened with Hitler was that a lot of people in the West actually supported him mm -hmm. in his rise to power, the Catholic Church, I believe, and, mm -hmm. and other Western um, interests who later entered the war against him. Mm -hmm. um, but they were already way out of harmony with truth, it, the truth about love, the truth about integrity and justice. So mm -hmm. I feel that non-violence is... Um, it means not being physically violent, but it doesn't mean being lying down under the steamroller it means yeah. standing up and saying this mm -hmm. steamroller is actually wrong <laughs> um, but there's, and a, there's an additional part of it and that is the issue of forgiveness yeah. you see on earth we have this belief that our life on earth is finite temporary and should be elongated as much as possible we, we, mm. should, we should survive yeah. and once we come to terms with the fact that we survive 
anyway, whether we pass or not, then we're not so addicted to staying alive. So partly it's our fear of death mm. that causes us to be addicted to staying alive under all circumstances. And that's understandable. If, if we don't have evidence that there is a spirit world, if we don't have evidence that we do actually survive death, then that's naturally how we're going to feel. Isn't of it? course, but unfortunately there is huge amounts of evidence that we survive death and that most people are still very, very resistive to accepting. Um, but there's plenty of evidence that we do survive death and plenty of evidence that, that the underlying condition of mankind is just a condition of fear about it, fear about death. And, and, yeah, and in addition to that, we can love the fear of death or love the principle of love. Which one are we going to? Mm -hmm. uh, the fear of death is often just like, yes, we can say there, there's not much evidence or the way we've been raised makes us feel like there should be something to fear. But if we love the principles of love or nonviolence in this example more than we're willing to um, honour the fear of death, if you like, then... It, the fear becomes less meaningful and powerful in our life. Would you agree with that? Yeah, but I feel even more importantly than that, we need to understand that every violent act is preceded by a violent feeling. And every violent feeling needs to be released from us before we will become non-violent. So, mm -hmm. so there are plenty of people who try to practice non-violence in their lives, but who still have many violent feelings coming out of them. Oh, anger and rage mm -hmm. and other violent feelings coming out of them at any one point in time. To be truly non-violent, you're going to have to release all of the non-violent feelings coming out of you, all of the violent feelings coming out of you. Now, most of those violent feelings coming out of you are the results of injustices that have personally occurred in your personal life. And as a result of that, what injustices that you have not forgiven, that, that you still feel, uh, that are still within you. So... It's going to get to the point where all humanity needs to go through this process of actually releasing the underlying emotion that causes them to act in a violent manner. And the underlying emotions are hurt about violence perpetrated towards them. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a process, what I would call a process of forgiveness, where we have to actually go through this process of grieving all of the injustice that has happened to myself personally and once I'm in the state where I've grieved all of that injustice, I will no longer have even a violent feeling or thought towards another, let alone could actually, I could never take a violent action if mm. I had no longer any violent thoughts or feelings. Yeah. And that's where the changes are difficult. Mm. Because the changes are not just a matter of making an intellectual choice and saying non-violence is best, because when we're put in a personal situation where our own child is killed because mm. of somebody's violence, now we'll have a tendency to revert back to the old viewpoint of, no, there is some justifiable violence. Mm. Whereas if we have released all of the pain, personal pain, that is in us about violence perpetrated towards us and hurt perpetrated towards ourselves, and all of that has been released, now an event can occur and we would still be talking to our child because they're already passed, they're now in the spirit world if they've been killed, we'd still realise they're alive, there's nothing, there's no permanent harm that's happened to the person. We would go through the process of forgiving the individual who perpetrated that violence. And we would also then be in a state where we could be loving towards them and not perpetrate violence in return. And one of the biggest problems I feel we have on earth is there's still this tendency, even at a personal level, if somebody harms us, we have a tendency to want to return the harm mm -hmm. rather than actually forgive. So in the situation of 9-11, mm -hmm. the, if the American government was in harmony with love, then they probably should have said, OK, you've done that to us, but we're not going to do anything to you in return. Well, yes, making the assumption that there was terrorists who actually did the bombing towards, towards the USA in 9-11, mm -hmm. making that assumption, mm -hmm. if, if the American populace was in a condition of love, they would forgive the act without taking... Mm. reprisal actions. You sound like you doubt that it was terrorists. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, unfortunately, every if you look at... There's, a, there's an old adage in most criminal investigations, and that is to look at who benefits from any, from any act. Now, in the case of this terrorism act that's meant to have been perpetrated towards the United States... The primary beneficiaries were the American government and the laws that they could then imply across uh, towards their people. 
in terms they can now put into put into action laws that took away the rights of the average American. Um, so rather than living now in a free will democracy, they're now living in a pseudo free will democracy because their laws are actually indicating differently now. Mm. And and who benefits from that? Uh, certainly not the terrorists. Yeah, I, I can see that, but it would be fairly implausible to think that the American government set all of that up. Oh, I disagree completely. Governments in the past have have continued to use their population as a, as a means of enacting certain things that they want to enact in order to have certain benefits. And if you look historically over the last 2,000 years at governments generally, you'll find history is littered with all of these type of events. Very mercenary. Governments yeah. are very mercenary even towards their own people. And, and so it's, uh, I don't feel it's implausible. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and certainly I feel quite strongly that the majority of governments on the planet, um, ha- and not, I'm not picking out the American government because I feel all governments on the planet have mm-hmm. this underlying manipulation of the populace in order to maintain power. And this is the underlying problem with most po- politics on the planet is that there is the manipulation of people to maintain power f- of a few. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the underlying backing of all of this power is nothing to do with political power. It's more to do with economic power and real power and and this is where I feel the majority of people on the planet need to understand the history of money and they need to understand the history of politics and and, and understand where all of these systems came from because if they fully understood where they came from they would never want to engage them anymore mm. <laughs> because the majority of them begin from with very unloving mm. beginnings. Yeah. I remember you relating a story a personal story of your own where you hit your son mm-hmm. about 17 times you said mm-hmm. because you were sticking a knife in the socket mm-hmm. and you were trying to show associate the uh, I guess having you know not removing the him which would have been the thing to do but you whacked him 17 times obviously to associate this act with something that he doesn't like yeah, well, and my, you have strong regrets over that now. Yeah, very much. Um, my thinking at the time was very different to my thinking now. Mm. My thinking at the time was, firstly, I believed fully in the Bible that if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. Mm. Secondly, I believed that I wasn't going to always be around my son. And as a result of that, he would have to be able to determine for himself mm. whether something was going to be dangerous yeah. or not. And because of that, I would, and my own fear of his lot for his, for his death... Um, I decided in that particular instance that it was better for him to associate some pain with the sticking the knife in the than socket to die. than to die. Mm. And so then I justified my own action. So yeah. my fear of his death justified my own action mm. of creating some pain or causing some pain for Tristan um, so that he, wouldn't, he would associate sticking a knife in the socket with something that was dangerous. Mm. Unfortunately, it had uh, not the desired effect Anyway, it would have had the desired effect in the sense that he no longer stuck a knife in the socket anymore. That's right. But unfortunately, it also had the other effect of him fearing me. That's right. The, uh, someone in the audience said, well, at least you saved his life. And your comment was? I didn't save his life because his life doesn't need, doesn't need to be saving. Mm-hmm. Um, he is alive whether his physical body passes or not. He's still alive. Mm-hmm. So, so I didn't save his life at all. All I did was save my fear. That's all I did. You said it would have been better for him to have passed than for you to have hit him. Yes. Can you explain the negative effects that hitting a child has on the child and the parent? Well, on the child, um, the the effects on the parent are the results of the effects on the child. So we'll talk about them Mm. separately. But... The effects on the child are, firstly, it has a violent act perpetrated towards it in the name of love. So now it confuses violence and love. So now it has a very, very distorted view of what love is and what, mm-hmm. love, should, and what love should be. Secondly, they will now have a tendency to justify violence in their own life in the name of love. And so therefore, there's a tendency for them to perpetrate violence towards others in the name of love in the future mm. as a result of the action. Thirdly, there's their own pain and hurt that is a result of the violence that is now inside of them, stored mm. inside of them. 
that will now attract events of a similar nature in the future as a result. Mm. And in other words, there will be this emotion in them of a fear of violence and a fear of a man attracting other men in their lives who are also violent towards them and therefore perpetrate violence towards them. And because of their fear of that particular violence that needs to be released, their fear will attract those new events. So there's a whole combination, and I haven't listed them all, obviously. Mm. There's a whole combination or series of events that occur as a result of that one act on the child. Mm. Now, for the parent, emotionally, the parent is going to have to compensate for every single one of those results of what happened to the child as a result of that one act. So in other words, the parent at some point is going to have to come to terms, emotionally come to terms, not only with the original act, but all of the subsequent results of that original act on the child and its life. So the parent will have what, what uh, we call from the spirit world, the law of compensation kicks into gear. They will have to compensate for every single thing that happened to that child as a result of that original act mm. that was perpetrated towards them. Now, th this law of compensation, you say, can be overridden. Mm -hmm. If we behave or we conduct our lives in a certain way, then we get cause and effect, yep. like you just described. Mm -hmm. But there is, there is an out, which you described as repentance. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it an out, though. It's not an out. <laughs> um, it's a higher law of love. So a law of, the law of compensation is a law about justice. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So in other words, if I perpetrate violence towards yourself, which then causes you to take further actions, which you probably will, to take further actions where you may damage yourself or others as a result of my violence towards you, then it makes sense that justice would demand that not only am I responsible for the original act of violence towards you, but I'm also partially responsible for the subsequent results of my act of violence towards you and what you chose to do after that point in time. That is the law of compensation, and that is a law of justice. So that's a certain amount of love, what I would call natural love. It's natural love for me to justly engage you in some manner. Then there's the laws of divine love, which are higher than the laws of natural love. So the law of compensation is a law of natural love. The law of repentance is a higher law connected with the laws of divine love. And the laws of divine love in regard to repentance are basically this. If I have a willingness to experience all of the pain that you have been caused as a result of my actions towards you, and I am fully open to experiencing that and feel, it, and feel a deep sense of remorse and sorrow for that, then I can be forgiven <coughs> through this desire, desire, this repentant feeling, be forgiven for those actions. But it will be a very emotional process. It's a process, unfortunately, that the majority of people don't go through because it's so emotional. So in other words, the majority of persons finish up going through the law of compensation where they compensate for an event over years of their life mm -hmm. rather than just going through this process of fully engaging emotionally the entire amount of hurt that I've caused towards another person and fully engaging it for myself and talking to God through that process of, and asking for God's forgiveness for that process and, and being willing to feel it all emotionally rather than actually compensate through my actions in the, in the future. And once I'm willing to feel it all emotionally, this process of forgiveness is, is underway, uh, where God forgives us for the act, well, and, and we are sorrowful and repentant for the act, to such an extent that we could no longer perpetrate such an act ever again. And once we do that, we, the actual causal emotion that created the act will disappear from us. And it's the causal emotion that created the act of violence that I need to address. Mm -hmm. And once that disappears from me, now... You've it, broken the cycle. I've broken the cycle. It's impossible for me now to continue or perpetrate an act of violence towards you because the reason for me doing so has disappeared. 
And that's repentance. And so I guess in the old days, this would have been called the forgiveness of sins. Yes. And if you were giving this same message 2,000 years ago... Well, I gave exactly the same message. Exactly the same message. <laughs> yep. It then got confused that Jesus has come to take away the sins of the world. Well, so, in some ways, I did come to take away the sins of the world. Um, not in a compensatory manner, in other words, not by my death and my dying, but rather by demonstrating to people how the sins of the world can be taken away. Mm. And it's through two processes, and I illustrated both processes. One process was the law of compensation, where you'd have to take actions and uh, that, that compensate for the wrong that you've done. And the other was through the law of forgiveness and repentance. Which, uh, or what I often call to or refer to as divine mercy and forgiveness and repentance. And that process I also described in the first century just like I'm describing it now. So, so those two methods are the only ways in which we as humanity can change. Now most of humanity takes the first path, which is this law of compensation, the natural laws of love, I call them. And I call that the wide road. In other words, the road that everybody takes. Mm. And then this other way, which was the natural, you know, the, the laws of divine love, which was divine mercy, forgiveness and repentance, the, and the, the process of repentance in the person, that I call the narrow way that leads to life. And, and few are the ones finding it, I said. And, but yet, that being the case, I did demonstrate both ways. Both, which we can take. We can take both ways. Uh, one way will lead us to be perfecting our natural love. The other way will go further than that because it will actually join us with God. Yeah. Okay, so in this, um, in this spiritual development, you also say that as we develop our soul, our soul will then mirror or our soul will reflect on our, phys on our spiritual body which will then reflect on our physical body. And a lot of, if we go through this process of looking at these unhealed emotions and we have this desire for this relationship with God by repentance, our soul will develop and everything will improve on a health level as well. Yes. Because all, all of our unhealthiness is created by fear. Fear creates all pain. And the more I release my fear and become more in harmony with love, the less fear permeates my spiritual body and my physical body. And therefore, my physical body and spiritual body have a, have a way to repair themselves, which is natural that God's created, in a perfect manner instead of repairing themselves imperfectly. Mm. And as a result of that, we will become more healthy rather than less healthy. We'll get to the point where we don't need a doctor anymore. And we get to the point where we won't even need a doctor if we cut ourselves or badly or anything like that because we're about to heal ourselves immediately as well. So we get to a point where we're so connected with God that the only thing that severs us from this life is if someone severs the cord. And that can happen still, of course. Mm. Uh, and any act of severe violence can cause a severing of the cord between the spirit and material bodies. But if that does not occur, we can heal everything. We can heal absolutely everything in our body and everything so in our you, body. So you are a personal testament of this, like uh, someone who was watching my last video said, well, if you'd told me he was 35, I would have believed you. <laughs> You're two years younger than me, yeah. but I look about 15 years older than you. Is this, is this part of the reason? It's part of the reason. Um, I've still got more emotions that I need to work through. So I'm still not as connected to God as I need to be and to be at one with God because I still have some emotional issues I need to work my way through. I still have some feelings of injustice in me that I need to work my way through that, that cause me to feel sometimes uh, angry and upset. And I have some fears that I still need to work through, fears mm -hmm. about my personal safety and Mary's personal safety and so forth that I need to work through. So that, you still have health issues? So I still have some health issues, yeah. Mm -hmm. But what I'm noticing myself is that every single health issue that I have, once I deal with the underlying causal emotion, the health issue is permanently resolved. So for example, when I was younger, I got very severe asthma, and I've had asthma all of my life. 
Once I started dealing with my grief and my fear of my grief, the asthma has disappeared and it's never come back. So I don't have asthma anymore. And I've also had uh, a lot of problems with hay fever all of my life. I found that it was linked to my parents' emotions in a lot of ways, that in terms of me trying to get their approval in many ways. Once I worked my way through a lot of the grief and, and all of those kind of things about that, all of the hay fevers disappeared. I used to take antihistamines every single day. Now I've never taken any now for four or five years. Like, so, or maybe even longer than that. And, and so that's all gone. There uh, are problems with my body that my body creates when I have a certain emotion. So I used to have problems with my hands, where my hands would, would crack and blister and crack apart and bleed. Uh, just by themselves without any trauma happening mm. to them they just do that and then as I work through different emotions associated with that now that doesn't happen at all anymore and so forth so every single emotion we have is linked to an, a, some kind of injury in the physical form and, and any disease or any sickness that we get are all related and if we deal with them emotionally mm. we'll find that we can permanently cure every single one of them until we get completely healthy and I, I feel pretty healthy now, but I still feel there's some areas that I need to improve. My eyesight's one of them, and mm. I'm working on the emotions that deal with that. And I've also got some stomach issues in the lower bowel. Haven't we all? <laughs> <laughs> that, that are due with certain emotions that I'm working through right at the moment. And yeah. I can feel they're related because mm. I can feel all the muscles and everything just loosening as I deal with those particular mm. emotions. And as that all loosens up, everything works a lot better. And so I know that these emotions are related yeah. and those, those problems are related to those emotions. So you even think it would be possible for someone like myself who had Bell's palsy and lost complete uh, paralysis of one side of the face um, and the nerves have come back over two years, yeah. but not, not well enough. Yeah. You know? So I still have trouble blinking, yeah. still have saliva coming. And you say that it's possible for... For me to be totally restored back to normal health. Yes. If I follow this path of yours. Yes. But it has to be followed sincerely. Mm. And that requires true changes at the soul level, not imitation changes. Because, so what I find a lot of people... What's an do, imitation change? Well, an imitation change is somebody trying to be... Trying to be Like emotional, a monk. Or, or, well, either one. Like, try... There are some that are trying to be emotional because they've realised that emotions are the way to go. So what they do is they start engaging emotions that are not real mm. and that's false and that's not going to work. And the alternative a lot of other people have chosen is, you know, solid, solitude, um, meditation, meditation and so forth. And while that has certain benefits to itself, physically I've seen a lot of people who are involved in meditation still die of cancer, for example which indicates that the emotion still exists within them that creates the underlying, the so underlying disease. So this is what's interesting about you guys is um, you don't just say this may be the case. You say this is the case. Mm -hmm. You don't say, well, now most doctors might say, yeah, we understand that stress is related to cancer. You guys say cancer is directly because of this. No exception. Even in a child, uh, who was no, there's two things we say. Say, unfortunately, what happens is that a group of emotions that we have also create certain attractions, and those attractions are not just of a material nature; they are also of a spiritual nature. In other words, people in the spirit world are also attracted to us while we're having certain emotional condition. So, unfortunately, for many people who have diseases of certain different types. There's firstly the shutdown emotion that creates the tendency towards the disease, but also creates an attraction from spirits who have also experienced a very similar disease in their own life on, this, in, on Earth, and that exacerbates the attraction. So in the case of a child, for example, who might have leukaemia, usually that is caused by the parents being open to a certain type of emotion projected at the child, and the child then is open to that emotion, often then different multi-generational spirits attach themselves to the child and those multi-generational spirits often died of cancer and those then we've now got both a physical, emotional and a spiritual cause for the child developing le leukaemia. 
So what do you do in that case? Well, you need to address all of the causes. So the prior, so one of the causes is talk to the spirits who are involved with the attachment to the child and tell them what they're doing to the child. They're actually creating cancer in the child. Not so, many parents can, are even aware of that, let alone can do that. No, but, but anybody can talk to a spirit. It's just a matter of sitting down and talking like we're talking. And just, just for the majority of times, it's, a, it's usually a parent or a grandparent that's attached to the child. And uh, it's a matter of just talking to that parent or grandparent and talking about the damage that they're doing to that child or the spirit who's attached to the child. Secondly, the parent themselves needs to deal with the emotion that causes the openness to this kind of attachment. And, uh, and those emotions are many and varied, but oftentimes with regard to cancer, it's an emotion where there's a willingness in the parents to engage uh, oppression in order to feel loved or give love. So uh, we see this a lot in dynamics um, on the planet where, where I will love you only when you give me certain feelings that I want. You don't have to do anything for me, but give me the feelings. And as long as I get those feelings from you, I will give you love. And we'll both feel like we're in a good relationship. Whatever that relationship is, father, son, friends, mother, daughter, mother, son, whatever the relationship is. Now, now if we deal with these codependent addictions uh, in these relationships, we will actually go towards healing a lot of the underlying attractions that are caused as a result of these codependent addictions. And as a result, the spirits will no longer be able to influence our child. And if our spirit, spirits can't influence our child, then our child is going to remain healthy because it will, it will have full control of its own system, mm -hmm. its own spiritual and physical system. And so therefore it will not get sick. And so we can cure any problem on earth. We can cure cancer, we can, but, but not with physical means or medical means as most... But at a spiritual and emotional level. Yes, yeah, to cure every disease. And, and we're, you know, once one, one, the first person becomes at one with God again on the earth, and we'll hopefully be able to illustrate this to people so that they can have some faith in that process. At the moment, I'm just talking about it, mm. but, but because no one's at one with God on the earth at, at present, and, you know, there's not much of a belief in that being true. Mm -hmm. But once there's somebody on earth in that place, you will see that they can't get sick. They will look around 25 to 30 years of age all their life. They don't need to die because their body is in a fully replenishment, in a full cell replenishment cycle that God's created. And, and also any children they have will not get sick. Mm -hmm. And they will not have any other problems like that. Okay. Now, Mary, we'll bring you in here. <laughs> I still your... have things I want to say, but it doesn't quite get No, <laughs> yeah, I've noticed you're trying to come in. Um, on your website, there are links to MP3 downloads where we can hear you channeling. Yes, yep. Um, now, last time we spoke about spirit influence, um, but I didn't know that you did actually did channeling. Um, you, you've only done it a few times by the looks but there's other people on the website there who have channeled spirit yeah um, I channel quite often quite you do often. quite often it's, it's just, just that you haven't put them on always record them yeah okay. um, Most pretty days. much daily mm. pretty much daily I would talk to our guides uh, you're in demand aren't you <laughs> well um, they're possibly in demand in my oh, life because they give me a lot of guidance and assistance uh, to things that I might be um, neglecting or blocking in in the way I'm living and loving, mm -hmm. um, and that's usually what I consult them about, um, where I might be stuck emotionally and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. But also, we speak a lot with spirits who are in darker conditions, who um, are struggling themselves, who haven't understood their passing, or haven't understood mm -hmm. why they're in such darkness after they pass. Yeah. Now I've, I've listened to a few of those. And um, either the medium is an incredibly good actor, which I doubt they could be that good, or what is happening is true. Now, when I was about 25 and I was heavily into New Age stuff, I was reading Richard Bach's um, Illusions, and he was trying to ascertain whether there was a spirit world. And so he was trying astral projection and all of these things to really 
you know, because if we do know that there is a spirit world, that changes a lot of perspectives, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. Um, you guys seem to deal with it like it's an everyday thing. Mm. Now, and you, when counselling these spirits, you counsel them, so you get them to sort of understand where they're coming from and how they can get out of the mess that they're in. Mm-hmm. But you also call on your friends uh, often mm-hmm. to come to them. Mm-hmm. Now, you say you don't see spirits. You don't hear, hear them talking to you. Is that true? Um, well, in a traditional psychic sense that most mediums would have, I don't hear them in the same manner that a traditional medium would hear them. And I don't uh, see them in the same manner that some people do see spirits. But you sense them because you're always saying at your meetings and there are a lot of spirits who are asking the same question. Well, how do you know that? Yeah. And the more sensitive you become emotionally, you're sensitive to everything around you, not just physical people, but everybody who's in present, whether they're physical or in the spirit world, but present. And, uh, and so you can actually connect with any person in the universe and find out their condition and talk to them as well. Uh, and... And, and feel their condition, actually, accurately, mm-hmm. and feel their history, feel what happened to them, what events happened to them in their life and so forth that have caused them to be the way they are and so forth. And this is a capacity of every person's soul, like not just my own. Yeah. Um, every single person can do this, but it requires a lot of uh, emotional openness and also a lot of healing of your own emotional condition. Because the more emotions I have inside of me that are yet to be healed with with love, the less sensitive I become to the emotions that you might have that are that are unhealed with regard to love. Whereas the more healed I became in regard to love, the more sensitive I became to everybody around me and, and their own unhealed emotions and their also also their thoughts and their feelings on a pretty constant basis. So it's easy to know what a person's thinking and what a person's feeling. And in fact, you get to the point where it's completely transparent. So in other words, you can say the thought that the person had oftentimes better than that they actually could verbalise the thought themselves. Or you can say the emotion that they're feeling oftentimes better than the, they can actually feel. Do you feel emotion. that you're getting, that this is happening with you, that uh, as you progress, are you becoming more sensitive to all of this? Certainly. Like, often myself and Mary will have a conversation. Mary's not aware of her own emotion, uh, and yet I'll verbalise her own emotion, and she goes, that's exactly what I was feeling, mm-hmm. and she will go off and feel, feel that. I think uh, m- most people in our life experience that with you, babe. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you speak to them about what, what's happening for them, most people would say that. That that's exactly on the money, and sometimes they say no, 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 that's not right, and come back a week later and go, wow, that's I can really. Mm. Uh, Usually they say that's not right, and come back three years later. Three years later, <laughs> and say so, depending on yeah. and say so, yeah, that was right. You know, usually that's about the time frame. <laughs> yeah. So your interaction with spirits is a lot on that basis. AJ's just feeling them, just yeah. like he feels my soul so rather do you, than yeah, having a mediumistic sorry. ability which is yeah. more probably what I have because so, I don't have the soul development mm. always to feel that yeah I've, I've often heard you say to somebody you're fairly mediumistic and they mm. didn't regard themselves as being that mm. way what what do you mean by mediumistic is it like, like open to spirit yeah influence? so I I feel that every person <coughs> has this sense of being able to communicate with spirits from, on a spiritual level, if you like, spirit body to spirit body, mm. and we all have that ability. But some of it, in some of us, it's more developed than others. Like for yourself, you're quite musically gifted, and that's something that has just been more open in you for for your life. Everyone has some musical ability, just that most of us have it severely suppressed by mm. some emotions from our childhood, or mm. um, or the the pristine nature of our soul is not in that direction our passions are not in that direction and the same thing applies for mediumistic ability um we all have it to some degree but others are some among us are more open to those to those communications and experiences mm-hmm. uh, yeah that's what I was so how do you call on these divine 
celestial beings to come to the aid of the person who you are talking to in the spirit world are, are these are they, are they constantly working with you are they working with Not you now <laughs> they, they're constantly working but you, but you seem to call them well um every well there's a few things we need to understand firstly every single person has around them spirits that are pretty much all times so so they're always there anyway they're always there anyway. you just you just some of those spirits are benevolent some are malevolent and some are just what you'd call neutral. pretty neutral you know they don't care mm-hmm. either way but for some reason they feel attracted to you for, for some purpose or thing that you're doing that's different to what happens with myself and in with myself it's recognized in the spirit world that um, um, <laughs> that and this is going to be hard probably to accept but it's recognized in the spirit world that that I give a lot of direction to spirits in terms of helping other people in the spirit world mm. and and therefore I have a lot of friends in the spirit world who I, who I call my friends who I've taught through many thousands of years of time the last 2000 years to you know how best to help other people and they have the same desires as I have to help other people. Mm. And so what happens is I just enlist their assistance to demonstrate certain truths to the spirit who I'm trying to help, um, just to help those spirits who we're trying to help get over certain emotional impediments to receiving that help. And, and so there are literally quite a few million spirits in the spirit world who I can call on for assistance uh, who will respond to my call when I when I ask for it, um, particularly when it's for the purpose of helping others mm. in the spirit world to to grow and change and and become connected to God. And so, um, whenever I'm talking with any person in the hells, for example, in the spirit world, um, and trying to assist them, then off, I'm very conscious of who's around them at the time who have been wanting to assist them for some time, and then I just call on that silently, so generally, uh, call on them for the assistance while I'm speaking to that particular person. And, um, and then by illustrating the relationship, I can illustrate a lot of truths to the spirit in the hells that they might not otherwise accept without that additional spirit help from mm-hmm. other people. Mm-hmm. And can I add to that? Because I feel it's really um, a beautiful quality of God really that when and many people have experienced this when they're in a really troubled or difficult time in their life and they suddenly find that they really ask for help (laughs) they really and they have an experience that is quite spiritual often sometimes they feel like they've experienced God's love or God's help or some divine intervention in their life and the truth about God and our celestial friends who are all um, people who've lived on earth who are now in the spirit world who are now in harmony with God's love to the, to the same degree um, or to the degree that they're at one with him in terms of their love um, is that when we truly ask for help from God and from these beings who are now at one with God we will always receive it it's just that often in our uh, injury and in our ego we don't ask very sincerely we ask on our terms but um, I feel that when a person asks and you're always asking sincerely and uh, from and I mean from a space that is not invested in self then we do receive help and that's why I joked at the beginning that celestial beings aren't just helping Jesus although they they do spend a fair bit of time with him (laughs) but um, Mm -hmm. They, they want, they desperately desire to assist all of us. Mm. They're just waiting for the correct conditions in our soul that we would be open to receive that help. Mm. Yeah. yeah. One, one, um, one person, was, one spirit was uh, having some problem and you called someone and you said, who are you, who are you talking to? And they said, Michael. And who's the other one? And, and she said, uh, Juliet. And you said, oh, Michael and Juliet, like they're all friends, you know. <laughs> Who are Michael and Juliet in the spirit world? Um, I can't remember that conversation. <laughs> Can't you? No. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm not sure who you're referring to. Um, I don't okay. think it was Juliet, though, was it? Um, My, um, Michael and someone. 
and um, you said, oh, they are uh, in fact soulmates. Genevieve, is it? No, no, I can't remember the comment. I have so many. Look, look, we have a conversation with spirits every single day. So mm. in the space of the four years I've known Mary, you know, I've probably conversed to like probably close to 13, 1400 spirits probably or more than that on a one-to-one basis. And, and then there's also a very large groups. So it's not always easy for me to remember and recall every conversation. Okay. Um, but... Um, I can always feel the spirits with the person that I'm trying to assist, whether the person's on the earth or in the spirit world. And and if they're in the spirit world, it makes it a little easier because we can illustrate these connections quite easily. And, um, and so what I do um, is always try to help them become more conscious of what's going on around them. Most people... Even on Earth, most people are not very conscious of their environment and what's going on around mm-hmm. them. They're very insular in, the, in, the, in that they're having their own life. They see everything from their own perspective. They very rarely see what's going on around them from, the, from a different perspective than their own. And the same applies in the spirit world. You know, everyone in the spirit world who's in the hells of the spirit world or in the first sphere of the spirit world in particular uh, are very insular. They often only see what's going on around them from their own perspective they don't see the full picture of all the spirits that are surrounding them, including spirits who want to assist them. And so all I'm trying to do most of the time is connect them with Mm -hmm. those spirits who have been with them oftentimes a lot of their life that they've just never seen, uh, but now they have the capacity to see if they desire it and uh, and connect them together so so that they can be more satisfactorily helped. So can you sense spirit influence at the moment? Of course, everyone here has spirit influence. So, you know, there are spirits with Igor, who's behind one of the cameras, there's spirits with Lena behind the other camera, there's spirits with yourself, there's spirits with Mary, and there's spirits with myself. And so, so in a single room where there might be five people, uh, you know, connected together, on the average, in, a, in an average person's situation where there's five people like this, there probably is a good 15 to 20 other people on the average in the same room with them. Uh, earthbound or from the spirit world trying to assist them. In our case here, uh, there's many more than that because there's a lot more interested observers that are going on, uh, observing everything going on. So there's quite a few million spirits associated with what's going on with this interview, even though there's only five people here in the room. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, Because of the different uh, interests that different ones have in the material being discussed, in myself and Mary's life, uh, in... uh, relation to the truths that we're presenting and so forth so and uh, and many of those spirits are also some of those are antagonistic they, you know they're looking for ways to you know attack myself and mary in order to you know reduce the amount of truth that's available yeah. on earth and so forth so now, i went to a psychic years ago he yes. said he was a psychic 30 years ago yeah and he gave me an aura reading for 45 dollars and uh and he said, now you've got this, um, he said, you're semi-vegetarian, aren't you? Because your is not clear. And he said, now you've got this, um, what appears to be a highly evolved spirit guide, this spirit with you. He said, you've got no dark souls with you. And I thought, oh, well, there's a plus. He said, you've got this, what, this bright light that keeps pushing down some light and, uh, is this just a load of nonsense that he's talking, or...? Uh... Well, some of it was true and some of it was false. Um... The truth is it changes daily. It's a daily proposition oh, okay. with you. <laughs> it's not that they latch on for life and stay there forever. Well, he said this being was with me certainly... throughout this life, yeah. and because they were highly evolved, they were never going to interfere. You know, they're just going to just going to watch. Well, the, the truth yeah, is, is, not... is that, is that nonsense? Is that what's happened for yourself personally? Okay. And you have an old relative... A spirit. I think it's, it feels to me to be your great grandmother, who is on the divine love path, who is a who is at one with God, who has been influencing your life in the sense of when I say influencing your life, trying to assist you to discover truth in your life, and has caused you to be a person who has a desire to discover truth as well. Caused you to have a strong interest in discovering truth all of your life. You've never really firmly settled on any one singular truth uh, because of her influence. 
Um, so she is certainly with you. However, the medium will also didn't want to acknowledge who else is with you. <laughs> um, and many mediums are like this. They, they well, for a start, they're charging you $45. <laughs> um, so that indicates that, uh, that love doesn't necessarily direct their actions in terms of providing the information they're providing, and they want to give you a service for the fee mm. that you've provided. And they know that if they upset their client too much, then that person may not return and so they often, they also often have personal feelings uh, mm. that are involved. Like many of them have quite dark spirits surrounding them, and they don't want to admit to those either. Mm. They don't want to admit that they themselves are being influenced. So, what is it that they didn't want to tell me? Well, um, you also have spirits who are into, trying to influence you along an intellectual path quite strongly. Mm. So, so, while you have this, this woman who, great grandmother, who, who is influencing you on a positive path uh, and trying to influence you to be attracted to God's truth, if you like. You also have quite a lot of intellectual spirits surrounding you who cause you to go through these cycles of doubt and um, indecision in spirituality in particular. And so they, they have uh, a similar influence upon you in the sense that they, when, when, when your great-grandmother gets to the point where she's almost got you interested in something that she feels would be very beneficial to you, often these other spirits kick in and influence you, you away from doing those particular things by, by manipulating your fears and your doubts. And, um, and so there is this to and fro going on, which has been a cycle in your own life, if you think about it, with mm. regard to spiritual development. Mm. And then there's uh, also other spirits who surround you just because of the law of attraction uh, in terms of common attractions. So you have a, a large uh, number of women who cycle in and out of your life in the spirit world who are quite demanding and angry with you and you have a tendency to pander to their particular uh, demands at different times and they project those demands at you through women in your life but also when you're alone they, they project the demands at you as well during those times and and of course the medium wouldn't have wanted to tell you all of that because the medium has no idea of how you can solve all of that or or, or prevent any of that from occurring mm. and unfortunately what I find is that in fact most people who are mediums who actually believe themselves to be very versed on spiritual matters have really no not much of an idea of what's really going on around them surrounding themselves or surrounding the other person However, some of the statements they make are very true. So the statement made about, uh, you know, your grandma being with you. Um, highly, the reason why he called it a highly developed spirit is because he couldn't associate it with a grandmother uh, himself because he feels that someone who's that highly developed can't, has to have been dead for many thousands of years. You know, that's his feeling. And so they wouldn't have told you who it is because the spirits with him who are telling you the information don't want to acknowledge to themselves that someone who's only been dead a few years in comparison to themselves is in better development than themselves. And it's so complicated, doesn't it? So, well, yes, it's, exactly. It's very similar to our relationships on Earth, isn't mm. it? <laughs> we all have, well, often have investments in, in investments, how we're perceived, agendas. in what we want, in the information we want to give. And so if you, if you remove the mystical, their spirits and we're human aspect... It very much resembles our interactions that we have mm. with, uh, with other people. Mm. So it's nothing special, you know. It's like if, if if these people were on Earth, they'd be trying to attempt to influence you mm. in similar manners, probably. Um, and uh, and every single person has it. So it, you know, we don't have to feel bad that we've got these people with us, or or good for that matter. Mm. And we just need to feel what it's about and and what causes these attractions and how you know they influence our life and i feel understanding the truth of that is a that's very empowering once we recognize it's not just the three of us here in this interaction there's other people and if we want to be sensitive to that mm. and understand that we actually can grow in our own self-awareness and develop in love really yeah. ultimately yeah. so i was listening to this girl on the abc a couple of days ago who was talking she's written a book she was anorexic and mm. she's she actually talks about Anna. Her name is Emma. Mm -hmm. 
and she says, but Anna tells me to do this. Mm -hmm. Could this be the case with anorexia, a, uh, a strong spirit influence? Well, there's firstly got to be the underlying emotional condition that creates the attraction. So that firstly has to occur. Then once the attraction has occurred, then the spirit can certainly come and give the person messages. So in the case of a lot of uh, disease, what are classified as diseases of the mind or mm -hmm. mental, mental illnesses, mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are actually heavily spirit influenced. In fact, all of them are heavily spirit influenced. Um, and it's very difficult um, dealing with such people because after a while they're told that they might have a dissociative identity disorder or they're told that they've got some other problem but oftentimes it is just spirits talking to them and, and browbeating them to submission into certain actions that they then willingly take because of their own emotional condition and uh, if people understood the amount of spirit influence that are under the majority of people would be quite freaked out they'd be quite frightened and because of that the majority of people don't want to know but it is far better to know than it is to not know. Mm. And it's far better to see them as spirits rather than just a voice in your head or some kind of other external influence, uh, other internal influence. The key is always that there is a, there is a um, precluding emotional condition that allows the spirit to influence us, any of us, any of the time. And so there's always a necessity to be responsible for our soul. We can't say, oh, it's just all spirits and blame externally. There's a reason why they can have this influence over us, mm. and um, so we can't just say the devil made me do it. So exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, although a lot of people still say that, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, uh, we'll get on to uh, honesty. There's another thing that you take to the extreme. <laughs> can, can you take, you take honesty to the extreme? <laughs> <laughs> no, most people can't do it at all. <laughs> I know I can't. But you say this is absolutely necessary mm. in our spiritual development mm. to be honest with not just us, not just others, but ourselves. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, you can't even progress to like the third sphere, mm -hmm. as you call it, mm -hmm. um, which is not, not even where we were when we were born, mm -hmm. without being totally honest. With think of how honest you were when way, you were born, by the way. When we were, we were, we were conceived. Yeah. 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 But even think about how honest you were when you were two. That was pretty much more honest that was pretty than honest. you are now, isn't it? You know, you had a, you had a hung, hungry, hungry feeling and you just screamed the house down until you got it. And it didn't matter where you were. You, you could be in the shopping centre or the... <laughs> if you didn't like something, you said it. Or the library. <laughs> Someone asked you what you thought about something, you said exactly. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. And we do learn to detune from honesty. So you have you say that... We have to be honest and completely disregard the consequences. Yes, um, in the sense that, in the sense that, usually the consequences will all be good anyway, <laughs> because mm -hmm. because any time we bring ourselves into harmony with laws of love, we will automatically be working along with all of those laws. As soon as we take ourselves out of harmony with laws of love, then telling untruths or lying or withholding truth is out of harmony with the laws of love. As soon as we come out of harm with the laws of love, there are always going to be negative consequences. Always. And usually it's our investment in the consequence that makes us not tell the truth anyway. It's this it's a fear of the consequence. Well I would, and it's I would a disregarding even go further than of that. the law that I you're feel, saying. I feel it's a fear of the temporary consequence. Because <laughs> it's not the permanent consequence. But you know, if if we looked at the permanent consequences of truth, they're all good. It's only the temporary consequences yeah. of truth, which are people might get angry with me or people might get upset with me or something. And in the mm. end, that's an invest, a personal investment. In the end. And, in, in and you say we're often, we're often shielding, by not telling the truth, we're often shielding somebody from experiencing their own emotions, which is, in fact, not a loving thing to do. Exactly. exactly. Even and though we think, it, we think we're being nice by not telling them the truth. We're actually not being nice. We're actually not being nice. Yeah. And it goes back to what we were speaking of earlier about the resistance to pain that exists on the planet. We all, we don't want to feel our own pain and we all think, I don't want you to feel your pain because it might trigger my pain and it's bad for me so it must be bad for you. Whereas if we had this huge paradigm shift about the perception of pain and realised that it was innocent, it's not going anywhere until we get it out of us, yeah. then we wouldn't try and shield other people from their pain and we wouldn't want to avoid our own pain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you don't believe in lying 
You always, <laughs> you always tell the Does truth. Does anybody, really? <laughs> <laughs> you don't even like to admit, omit the truth. No. Not even a white lie no. is acceptable. When you say acceptable, it's up to people what they do. Um, but it's up to me what I do with my life. And, and a white lie is not acceptable to me. Yeah. For my life. Now, you also say that you are non-judgmental. You do not judge people. No. So you don't tell them what to do. You never tell anyone what to do because that's you imposing your free will on them. Exactly. And that's not, some, that's not loving. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Even And they have the right to do anything they wish, even if it's harmful. Even, even if it's an abortion, which you say is something that should we say wrong? Well, I, no. It, it, from, from the soul's perspective, it's a murder. And, and therefore bears the consequences of such. But, uh, but I don't judge the person for doing so, just like I don't judge a murderer for murdering. There's obviously an emotional reason inside of a person why they would make such a decision. So, for example, for many women who commit abortion, the emotional reason is because they don't like the man they slept with and they don't want to have a permanent relationship with him or tied to him. Another emotional reason might be the man told them to get an abortion, so they went and got one. So that, that's their hook into the man. And so even if they were raped, they should have that child? Yes, and, and my feelings are yes. And there are plenty of people on earth who would love to care for that child in a loving environment. So they don't necessarily have to raise it? No. They just have to have it. Well, this is another fallacy we have on earth, is that, is that we have this idea that we have to raise our own children, and we don't. <laughs> but, you know, the reality is we want to make sure that every child is raised in love. And, uh, and if that's not possible in one environment, then why not make it possible in another? And why condemn the person who's not ready to have a child, who's had one some, with some mistaken you know, process that they've been through? Why not allow them to, to give that child to another couple who can raise the child in love without the stigma of having given away that child? Mm. Um, the judgment of it is what causes a lot of these things to, yeah. to stay in place. I've had a lot of um, a few friends who have been adopted mm -hmm. and they never quite get over it why is that uh, a lot of times it's because of the emotions that have occurred between the time of conception and the time of birth with their own mothers or fathers or both with their birth with their natural mother or father or both so a lot of people who get adopted in the end have been rejected and unloved by their natural father and mother or both. And, and they've felt that from the time of conception. And they'll feel that from the time of conception. And so unfortunately, by the time they're, you know, they might be a few days old and then given to another couple, for example, um, that, that other couple might love them, but unfortunately there's already the predisposition to not being loved happen that's happened before then because of, the lack of love that went to the child mm. during the time of gestation um, before they were given away. And that's the causal reason why they have the emotion, but there's nothing to say that they couldn't mm. get over it and be okay with it if they were adopted into an environment where um, it was okay. Yeah, they believed in Who believed in um, honouring the pain that they felt and allowed that, then they would process through that by the time they're five and be scarless from that experience. Because there is a cycle of silence in, in, in these kind of matters generally. So shame, so and shame and silence in the sense that in the sense that the adoptive parents often are afraid of losing the child in some in some ways and so therefore are not totally open and truthful with the child about where they have actually come from until they're a much older age. And by that stage, the child's often in a shutdown condition emotionally, so therefore already feeling unloved and in a shutdown condition. Secondly, there is also the cycle of shame towards the parents who gave the child away, in the sense that uh, you know they often feel like they've done the wrong thing. Sometimes children have been taken away from their parents uh, purposefully. Uh, you know, for instance, parent grandparents taking the child away because they don't think their 15 year old daughter can handle the child or so forth and these kind of events have caused shame in the family and the shame isn't one to be discussed and as a result of that the adoptive child actually felt all of that shame during the time of gestation and still has that kind of shame inside of itself mm -hmm. and it needs to be addressed and emotionally addressed yeah. okay um, you believe that God has perfect laws in place Mm -hmm. 
And that if we just pay attention to what is being attracted to us with the law of attraction, mm-hmm. all of our mistakes and the things that we've done right in harmony with love will be revealed to us. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Okay, and you're vegetarian. We had a lovely vegetarian uh, meal, and that goes back to the fact that you don't believe in violence. Yeah, we're it. vegan, um, which means we don't have any animal products. And um, yeah, the main reason why is because of what people do on Earth with animals in order to produce those animal products. So, so uh, we would never want to eat any meat or fish or any other animal that gets killed for the sake of us eating it. Mm-hmm. But even things like eating eggs and milk and other things like that, we feel that if they were brought more into harmony with love, then those kind of products could be consumed. But unfortunately, a lot of times they're not harmonious with love. They're done primarily for the pur- purpose of human consumption. The, the chickens in the case of the eggs and the cows in the, and the calves in the case of the milk are often treated very badly. A lot of people on the planet are not aware of how badly treated these Mm. animals are and we can't we feel we can't engage that process by consuming those products which would further exacerbate the problem rather than helping solve the problem Mm. we also see there's huge amount of degradation of the environment as a result of mankind's thirst for meat Um, Mm. it's not just a single issue about violence to the cow it's all of the uh resources on the planet that are used mm. to support the growth of that animal mm-hmm. um, that are, it's very out of harmony with love and, and the loving thing to do is to always care for your environment and also also always do the most economical thing and being a vegetarian is about 10 times more economical mm. than being a person who eats meat uh, primarily because of the demands it places upon the planet yeah. and personally in my physical body I uh, I, I guess because we're engaged in a more loving practice, um, my body doesn't seem to lack for anything. Uh, I'm not deficient of anything, and um, I feel better when I don't eat any animal products. Mm. Um, and a lot of people worry about whether they're getting enough protein or getting enough vitamins from their diet if they become vegetarian or vegan. But, but that's all emotionally based. So it's still a lot to do with our belief systems, our parents' belief systems. So what mm-hmm. I've noticed a lot is that if a parent attacks the child for becoming vegan or vegetarian, then the child will often get a physical problem as a result of their veganism or vegetarianism. Mm-hmm. And, and once they deal with the emotional link between that and the emotion they have with their parent, then their body rights itself and they no longer have that particular deficiency. Um, but we see a lot of people going back to meat eating after being vegetarians because of what they feel are the deficiencies. But the deficiencies are all related to emotions that are related to their parents' mm-hmm. belief systems. So, you know, this is where we need to understand everything before we make choices and decisions, really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, the, uh, the standpoint on abortion, people say, oh, right to lifers, you know, this is a very fundamentalist Christian point of view. Mm-hmm. One thing fundamentalist Christians have a lot of trouble with is the gay and lesbian mm-hmm. uh, community. But you ha- don't have any problem with that at all? No. no. <laughs> that is not and and that say. would take a long time for you to go into, I know, which we probably don't um, have. It would take a while to cover, but rather than make a blanket statement that we have no problem with uh, <clears throat> gay and lesbian... But you do have a problem with infidelity. We, have a, we believe that sexuality is... Um, most perfectly expressed in love between soulmates and sometimes those soulmates are of the same gender and sometimes Mm -hmm. they're of opposite genders Mm -hmm. but god truly created our sexuality to be solely for our soulmate and ourselves Mm -hmm. and so we do um speak a lot about morality i suppose in terms of sex and love being joined together Mm -hmm. within a relationship and when that's not the case that we're out of harmony with the way God intended it to be. So with both heterosexuality and homosexuality, there is a tendency towards, on the planet today, there's a tendency towards what you would call um, permissiveness. And permissiveness is always going to result in sadness. So this is why many people in their personal relationships in their life 
finish up creating a lot of sadness because the permissiveness, the sexual permissiveness, attracts a lot of uh, damaging things to your soul. The key is to be to to still, um, you know, understand your own sexuality and be fully engaged in it, but to not do it in a permissive and immoral manner. And and when I say the word immoral, even it's just a word to me. It's not so a judgment. judgment. Yeah. Mm. And so so I'm not saying that as somebody who's permissive. Um, I deserves my judgment but what I'm saying is somebody who's per- permissive deserves my compassion because in the end I know they're going to create a lot of sadness for themselves over the course of their life in that permissive manner mm-hmm. um, if we engage our sexuality in a non-permissive manner, in other words we engage it as it purely was designed to be it's going to result in a lot of happiness in our life and a lot of happiness in our everlasting life actually and so you know we, we are very uh, happy to talk about issues of sexuality and so forth, but but we also want to put it within the um, law, if you like, that God created for it, and that is that God created it primarily for the interaction between two halves of the soul, and not to involve third parties in that process. Now, obviously, through the course of our life, we might involve, finish up involving third parties through the process because of our different emotions and different belief systems and so forth. But the key is to slowly correct those particular things and get to the point where we'll be happy and, and we'll be definitely happy if we finish up coming to terms with the way God created us. Mm. Yeah. Okay, the last question. Um, when I mentioned earth changes last time, I quoted something in Greece and, and you went, oh no. Sort of like you regretted saying anything when at the time. Because I heard at the last meeting someone else ask you a question and you said, now look, I did put a disclaimer on that. I'm just wondering, in your development, do you still make mistakes and do you feel that that was a mistake to actually say something that might cause fear in people who, do, who look at you and, and think that you well, know you more are, than they do? And, you're asking two separate questions. Do I, I make mistakes? Yes. Uh, I will continue to make mistakes until I'm at one with God. And every other person on the planet is also going to do the same thing. They're going to continue to make mistakes until they're at one with God. Do I feel I've made a mistake about disclosing what I feel about earth changes? No. <laughs> the reason why I don't feel I made a mistake is I was asked for my personal opinion and I gave it honestly. And, and Has I'm, that changed now? Has that, uh, that... Not much, no. Uh, no? no, but at the time... You said, I feel differently. Mary feels very yeah. differently than I do. What do you feel? About earth changes? Mm. Um, I don't know what to feel is what I feel. I... You want to start with? Yeah. Look, Jeff, I channel information about earth changes. I'm t- spirits are telling me information. And meanwhile, I'm sitting there going, eh, I don't even know if it's going to happen. I have this, this uh, deep felt cynicism about people waiting for the world to change mm-hmm. and I haven't worked through it and I, I have this real resistance to even <sighs> discussing earth changes because I feel that um, so many people are waiting for an external change rather than looking inward mm-hmm. to change mm-hmm. and recognising that it doesn't matter what happens externally unless we look inward and I feel if we reach for God it'll happen even more powerfully these changes that the real earth changes need to happen inside the people on earth and so but you also have a third uh, reason for finding it the third reason is that my dad has these has talked about earth changes all my life and this is added to my cynicism Mm -hmm. and um he also has issues with me now and the way i live my life and he cites AJ's discussion of earth changes um, some years ago as a reason why he doesn't like AJ. I feel his reasons are far more varied than that and much more related to the way my relationship with my dad has changed since I met AJ. But um, that also, because of the pain that I haven't felt in, that's in the, my relationship with my dad, it makes me resist even discussing earth changes. I still mm-hmm. fear that it's going to make him even more angry with us rather than just grieve that he is angry with us. Mm-hmm. So that's probably the full reason okay. why I don't want to talk about earth changes very much. Yeah. There's probably even another reason, which is I'm afraid that 
um, we will get it wrong. Uh, it won't happen exactly as we feel it is going to happen. And, and that was that and was why I asked AJ um, yeah. because you know I, you know how I like analogies. <laughs> I sort of liken that to, you know, a father in a car saying, okay, kids, I've got a feeling we're going to run off the road up here ahead. The car's going to crash and uh, your, your mother's going to go through the windscreen. And I'm thinking, is this something that a, a nice dad would, would be telling his children, you know? If you do know better, is it responsible of you to be saying something unless you're absolutely certain? Well... As I've said in all of the talks that I've given about Earth Chambers, my primary focus has been helping people deal with their fear. You see, on the planet today, I feel that fear dictates a lot of people's lives. And the main reason why a lot of people are asking questions about Earth Chambers or about 2012 is because they're afraid. And they want to get me to give them an answer so that they don't have to feel afraid. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And, and that's a very, um, like I feel the, the most important thing is they deal with their fear. And, I, and I've talked with them extensively about this. Like when I say extensively, I've very rarely mentioned earth changes in my public talks. However, I have mentioned them in the context of their fears. And if you look at even the recent talks I did in Greece, but even before then, all the talks I did about fear and all of those things, all the things the media focus on, all, all of those talks in context mm. were all about people dealing with their fears. Now, I feel that if people do not deal with their fears, they will finish it up attracting what they're afraid of. They, it doesn't matter about doesn't matter any fear. Any fear. Yeah. They'll finish up attracting what they're afraid of. Now, most people who ask questions about earth changes are not necessarily afraid of earth changes. They're afraid of dying. They're afraid of anarchy on the planet. They're afraid of all these different kinds of things occurring on the planet as a result of the earth changes. If you look at all the movies that have been produced recently, you know, movies like The Road and 2012 and The Day After Tomorrow and, you know, a lot of the disaster type of movies, they're all focused on what happens after these events mm. and the anarchy and the self-interest and all of these other emotions that come into play after these events. And this is what people are afraid of. Mm. And, and what we need to do is help people work their way through their fears. Now, for that reason, if a person comes to me and says, what do you feel about earth changes? If I feel a certain thing is going to happen, I have no problem saying, this is what I feel. That's why that's, I'm being honest with them. Now, I'm not afraid of that. Often the person receiving the information is afraid of that. Mm. And then when that particular thing doesn't happen, uh, which, which um, you know, m may have occurred in the past on a very few of occasions in, in, in case of what I've said, um, they then get upset with me for mentioning it. And I'm going, no, I mentioned it because you were afraid of it. Mm -hmm. like, and you asked me what I felt and I was going to be truthful about what I feel even if I'm wrong. And I'm okay being wrong, but you're not okay with me being wrong. And the only reason why you're not okay with me being wrong is because you're afraid. Mm. And it's, it's different to you standing in the, the town square and broadcasting yeah, yeah. the end is nigh, isn't it? That's, that's really trying to incite fear. Well, I could never do that anyway because the end is not nigh. Yeah, but, do you know <laughs> what I mean? I don't, see, I don't see earth change events or potential earth change events. I don't see them as the end of the world. I don't see them as, a, like, you know, they called me leader of a doomsday cog. You know, I don't believe there's such a thing as a doomsday. Mm -hmm. I don't believe there's... A, a, I believe, in fact, that if we, we fully acknowledged all of the scientific information that's available to us right at this point in time with regard to what's happening to the Earth, every single person on the planet could survive coming events. That's what I believe. Um, I don't believe that's going to happen because most of us want to bury our head in the sand and most of us want to stay totally closed to any scientific information, even if we're a scientist. We often want to stay totally closed to a lot of scientific information that's available to us, unfortunately. But, but the potential is that every single person on the planet can survive, so therefore I don't feel it's a doomsday. I do feel, however, that mankind, through a series of events that are now happening, we've got, are going, is going to enter this place of a negative period of time from the perspective of them, not mine, of, you know, financial ruin and 
potentially also physical events due to the amount of fear that's happening on the earth projected at the earth and I feel those events are so likely as to be certain in my mind at this point in time now that doesn't mean in a year's time or six months time if people changed that people became far more fearless and released their fear and and we started to change the economic system of the planet so that so that it's not dependent on what it's currently dependent on that that the projection on the earth might be entirely different and therefore a whole di different set of events occur all i can do at any one point in time is say this is what i feel right at this point in time however i also say i'm not at one with god yet so i, I don't know for certain you've got to have to learn to trust your own emotions but you're not going to trust your own emotions while you're so afraid mm. and and so fear becomes the primary thing you need to address or deal with and this is the thing that I've been focused on with any discussion about earth changes. If you listen to every discussion I've had about earth changes with people, I've been focused on the level of fear they have about the subject and, the, and why is that fear present and dealing and re with and releasing those fears. Because we want to get to a point where no matter what happens to the earth, we're not afraid. And if we're not afraid, we're being in the best possible place to make poss good decisions. It's only when you're afraid that you make pretty bad decisions. And, and if all of us were in a place of not being afraid, we, we would have all the information available to us right now even. But because we're afraid, we don't want to hear the truth about different things that are happening on the planet. You know, there was a, for example, in, in the, in the um, NASA website about a year or so ago, for, for about 18 days, they'd posted that they'd discovered the sea floor in the Pacific rose by so I think it was like 600 feet in two days right now there was such a bombardment of their site from that one particular thing over those days that they removed it from their site mm -hmm. and what caused the bombardment fear people what does this mean you know what, you know they're afraid of what what's going to happen as a result of that particular thing now now I feel the reality is that that governments and institutions, if we collectively gathered all the information we have about the Earth at this point in time, we would realise that the Earth is going through potential cataclysmic change right at this point in time. And not only that, we'd know where the stress points are, we'd know how to, how to best protect ourselves from the potential in, in, in happenings, and we would also probably be able to almost all of us survive. But the likelihood of that happening at this point, given the amount of fear and our addiction to different things that we have as a planet, uh, as a human race on the planet, at this point, is fairly low. And as a result of that, the likelihood is if we do go through cataclysmic change, that there are also going to be quite a lot of uh, people passing as a result of the change. But I'm not even concerned about that, because mm -hmm. I know for certain that this life isn't all there is, and in fact, Life is just a continual life, a continuous thing. So I'm not afraid of that either. Even if I pass, I'm not afraid of it. So I don't, so I don't see how this um, feeling that people have of fear even needs to come about, really, at this point. Mm. Um, however, I do feel that we need to deal with fear as a human race. And, uh, and I'm perfectly okay with making statements about what I feel at any point in time about cataclysmic events of the future. Um, that I feel are potentially going to occur. And when I say potentially, I'm feeling that it's, at this point in time, I feel it's a certainty. Now, that might change in six months' time, but that's what I feel at the present, and that's what I felt a year ago or two years ago, and that hasn't changed very much. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it has the capacity to change unless mankind changes very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but I'm perfectly happy to answer people's direct questions about earth changes. Mm -hmm. um, or, or events that I feel will affect the earth. And, uh, and I feel that it's uh, like good to be, like one of the things that's really good to be on this planet is self-sufficient. And we have the capacity of being self-sufficient without the environment, environment being impacted very much at all, if, if at all. But if we eat meat and we, you know, we, keep, we keep doing the things that we keep doing with our environment, and uh, we're just going to put huge demands on the environment anyway, and sooner or later we're going to have some cataclysms, whether they're caused by the Earth itself or ourselves. Mm. We're going to have some cataclysms we're going to have to deal with. Yeah. Mm. 
All right. Well, we better stop there. No worries. Um, thanks again. It's nice and, to see you again, Jeff. Yeah. Oh, it's lovely to see you. Uh, probably the two most fascinating people I've ever met. <laughs> I'd have to say. Uh, there's surely, there's surely <laughs> other fascinating other people. people no, no, no. I've, I've been around. And uh, yeah, no. Thanks for that. And uh, if anyone watching the uh, the video, this interview wants to uh, look at uh, any more of what we're talking about here the detail you can there's what about 170 hours of you on youtube if they're interested in looking i think so and there's probably the 400 hours or so of dvds um, that yeah. there's quite a few hours we haven't uploaded to youtube yet and um, we haven't addressed every question no. yet no. that we would like to talk about but what we've been doing is focusing on the questions that the majority of people have asked or the subjects that we feel mankind at this point in time needs to address. But we feel as time progresses there'll be more information that we can provide on other subjects that will also be good, um, that'll be fascinating conversation and also learning things as well. But um, at this point, we, what we're trying to do is, is give as much information on the things that most people feel they need assistance on. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. But thanks for your time too. Yeah. 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 Pleasure.